This is The Speaking Show. I'm David Newman, and you're tuned in to the number one podcast for speakers, consultants, and experts who want to speak more profitably. Mary Kelly, CSP, welcome back. Thanks for having me, David. I'm so happy to be here. So what some people may not know, although if they know a little bit about you, they should know, you are a major economics geek. PhD, economics, breakfast, lunch, dinner, drinks, coffee, all up and down the street, correct? Yes, I get up every single morning and before I do anything else, I read about an hour's worth of economic data. Well, let's start there. Word on the street, and this is totally layperson, not even professional word on the street, but like, you know, entrepreneur word on the street. Oh my God, 2020, the big one's coming. We're due for a recession, depression, the sky is falling. Everything's going to be horrible. My first question before we even address that one is knowing the economic cycles and the trends and the data that you absorb every morning, how far ahead can we see at any given moment for real anyway? That's such a great question. So here's what's happening with the economy. First, there are leading and lagging indicators that we economists all look at all the time. And the geeky part about it is leading indicators are housing starts. Inventory issues are a current indicator. Lagging, of course, is unemployment. So right now, the economy is doing really, really well. Indicators that we look at are housing unemployment. Well, it's really, really low. Right now, if you want a job and you've got a pulse, you've probably got a job. So it's really easy to get a job right now. Consumer confidence is high. People are spending money and they feel good about spending it. That's different during a recession where people worry about spending money and they don't feel good about spending it. What we're seeing in terms of housing starts is that we should be having more housing starts, but two things are holding that back. First off, we don't have the labor the construction workers, the plumbers, the electricians. We should have about 1.3 million housing starts in 2019. We've got less than 900,000. So we've got fewer housing starts than we'd like to see, which means there is room for growth. So the economy is doing well. Now, this is a lot like you having a girlfriend and she's great and she's great and all your friends are going, okay, she seems great, but you know, the hammer's gonna fall, crazy's gonna come in, this is gonna be a problem. When we expect bad things, we manifest those bad things, as you know. But the indicators do look like next summer, we're going to have uncertainty in the market. Now, the big thing, of course, that's impacting that is the election. And whenever the markets have uncertainty, nobody likes uncertainty. You know, I was a a chief of police, and whenever you have a, a suspect in a room and you say, what have you done wrong today? All the uncertainty in their head comes out. It's the same with the market. Anytime there's uncertainty, people tend to pull back. They pull back their spending. And as you know, consumer spending in America accounts for 70% of our entire gross domestic product. It's a lot. It is a lot. So remember, the other parts of that is government spending and then business investment. And then you add in our exports minus our imports. And right now that's running a deficit. Now, the big trade issues that you've probably seen in the news... And depending upon where you are, you get very excited about it if it impacts you. Otherwise, you just go trade, wah, 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 and you ignore it because you think it just doesn't affect you. Well, the issue with the trade and the tariffs issues is we're all supposed to be trading nicely together without tariffs, but that's not happening. So right now, if America sends a car to Germany, we get taxed at another 20 to 30%. When Germany sends a car to us, it's only taxed at 5%. So these are some of the unequal things that the administration is trying to work out. But if you don't know the numbers, none of the conversations make sense. Now, let's look at our personal economy, because I know there's the economy and then there's our economy. As speakers, as experts, as small business owners, as entrepreneurs, we're looking at this data, we're listening to smart people like you, and I'm just channeling our listeners going, this is great, good to know. What do I do with it? Is this now a time to diversify? Is this now a time to sort of maybe shift some of our messaging to addressing the uncertainty and becoming more relevant in the marketplace? Like if your consulting is around what to do in times of uncertainty, if you have a speech that's like customer service in the era of uncertainty, can we somehow tag onto this or plug into that 
zeitgeist and become more relevant and more in demand. Whereas if we don't do anything, the tides might be receding and we'll get booked less. Right. And zeitgeist. Wow. Big words in the morning. That's fantastic. So first, many times when speakers get a whiff of uncertainty and entrepreneurs, or I'm talking business owners, I'm talking hairdressers, I'm talking anything. We tend to get unsure about what it is we do. And whenever we create uncertainty in our own brain, that does not focus make. So when I talk to people about how to recession-proof your speaking business, your author business, your entrepreneurship focus, I talk a lot about what it is you do best, that specialization, and that is what you need to do, and you need to do it better than ever. If, in fact, you have a viable product, a viable speech, a viable training program, a viable whatever you do, then you need to focus on that and make it the best thing ever. So first off, be very good at what it is you do better than anybody. Second, one of the things I talk to people about is if you think there's going to be a recession. Now, here's the thing. It's not a matter of if there's going to be a recession. It's a matter of when there's going to be a recession. We're always going to have these up and down business cycles. It's like an earthworm or a roller coaster or whatever you want. There's always going to be ups and downs. But the issue is, If push came to shove, would your clients go to somebody else? And that's the big question. So for example, let's say you go to the store and you're going to get cookies. Well, David, what's your favorite kind of cookie? Oreos. Right. And so you go to the store and you say, I'm going to get Oreos. I can only afford one package of cookies. So I'm going for the Oreos every time. But if you've got plenty of money and you're thinking about trying other things, you're going to maybe grab the ginger snaps, maybe the vanilla creams, maybe the graham cracker s'mores. You're going to diversify. But if you are on a limited budget, you're going for the Oreos every time. You want to be the Oreo. Wow. That's so great. We sometimes talk about how interchangeable is your expertise, right? Eh, One time management speaker, same as another time management speaker. One marketing coach, pretty much the same as another marketing coach, unless you're the Oreo, right? What I'm hearing you say is, we always hear about niche, 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 specialize, specialize, specialize. During this economic turbulence, you're saying that's more important than ever before. Yes, because when people have income that they are now worried about spending or revenue they're worried about spending. Let's say you're the training manager for a major corporation or you're running a conference. You're not going to try five different kinds of cookies. You're going to go with what you know is going to be a hit every time. So I have to tell you, I have one gal in Florida and she's probably booked me five or 10 times for different organizations. And she called me and she said, Mary, she said, this is a two minute phone call. Are you free on this date? I said, yes. And she said, great. She said, My committee is going round and round about this thing and they're just making me crazy. She said, I told them, why are we bothering with this? Let's just get the home run. Let's grab Mary and we're done. I said, that's what I like to hear. She goes, great, see you then. It was a two minute conversation. And that's what we want. If we are being compared to everybody else in a market where they were flush with cash and they've got lots of options, that's fantastic. And again, we have to be able to stay competitive, look around, see who our competition is. And you know how I feel about competition. We shall be helping our competition, not competing against them. But when the economy gets a little bit slower and people are a little bit worried about those expenditures, we need to make sure that they only think of us. If we're going to do something, it needs to be the home run David Newman. It needs to be the Oreo cookie. And there's just not going to be any other option. So let's pivot into kind of what we should be doing in good times and bad times. I know one of the mantras that you always teach and preach to any small or solo business owner is for heaven's sakes, run your business like a business. How are we not running our business like a business? And what are some basic, basic building blocks that you see so many consultants and solopreneurs totally miss the boat, totally ignore, totally put their head in the sand and go, oh, that doesn't apply to me. I don't need a P&L. I just got my own little solopreneur business here. What, profit? What, margin? What, expenses? What, retirement plan? No, no, that's for big company guys. That's not for little you and me. What's wrong with that thinking and how are we missing the boat? 
so many things wrong with that thinking. And you know, I've said it a thousand times, run your business like a business. And if you're not, it's a hobby. And if it's a hobby and it makes you happy, that's fantastic. But then please don't come crying to me by saying, oh gosh, you know, my business isn't doing this or I'm not doing this. Well, wait a second. Many of the people you and I both know are not running their business like a business. They do it when they want to. They don't schedule their days. They are not taking things seriously. They're not spending money in the right places. So let's just look at that for a minute. First, when times are good and times are really good right now, people tend to get a little bit lazy. And I'm going to say it, lazy. So I talk to some of our friends and I say, what did you do today? And they say, well, I got up and I did this. I wanted to... And I said, no, that's not a work day. A work day is get up in the morning, go to your office and do the things that you know are going to make you money. And that's the first thing you should do every single day is have a schedule. Second thing, focus on the things that make you money. Don't do the things that make you feel good, like check Facebook to see how many friends you have today or go on LinkedIn to see who shared your message. No, start off with doing the things that are going to make you money first. Do the important first. So that's number two. By the way, we have a nickname for that. It's MMA, money-making activity. It's not mixed martial arts. It's money-making activity. Money-making activity. And the money-making activity needs to be first and foremost. But you also need to have those daily habits. It's an eight to 10 to 12 hour workday. And if you're not doing it, then guess what? You're running a hobby, not a business. So have the structures in place to make sure that you always know what the next step is in order to make money. That's number three. And number four, and this is one of the things I'm seeing a lot with our entrepreneurs is they're getting a little bit complacent and arrogant. They're getting arrogant because they're like, I should raise my fees because everybody wants me. Mm -hmm. That's today. Is that going to be the case in one year or two years? And if you raise your fees, are you going to lose some of those lower hanging fruit people who can't afford that? And there are some people who can. And if you raise your fees, are you delivering the same value that other people with those fees are doing? Because my friend David Newman says, guess what? If you're a $15,000 speaker, you're not competing against other $15,000 speakers. You're competing against the $15,000 speaker who's willing to do that speech for $10,000. That's your competition. So we have to make really sure that our arrogance and our sense of self-importance does not get in the way of our business plan. Hey, good looking. Are you currently getting paid to speak? Would you like to ramp that up? We can help. Book a confidential speaker strategy call with our team at doitmarketing.com slash call. And let's see what we might do together. The call is free, but the results may be priceless. Well, I know one thing that you're passionate about and really expert in is this whole concept of taking care of your retirement and being retirement ready so that we don't die broke or homeless or sitting in the gutter with a bottle of liquor. Although that does sound like fun on some days. As an independent speaker, coach, consultant, et cetera, how do we even start thinking about that whole retirement planning thing? So here's some scary statistics. So I ask a lot of folks, so how much money do you need to retire? And a million dollars is a commonly used term. It's a nice round number. I don't know who decided a million dollars was a good number if you're a baby boomer, but that seems to be a very popular number. So here's what's scary. If you have a million dollars, this is easy math. We can talk about math. It's not hard. If you have a million dollars and you are going to take out 7% every year, so that's $70,000 a year to live on, okay, and you're making maybe 5% in the market on the principal, what's left of that million dollars, you run out of money in 18 years. And see, people don't understand, oh, but I have a million dollars that should last. Well, once you start taking money out, it doesn't last as long. So the average person in America says they're going to work to be about 67 years old. The reality is the average American has to retire at 63, either to take care of themselves, a family member, a child, for some reason, they have to retire earlier. Now, in the speaking world, we're very lucky because we can scale back our speaking if we want to and continue to make revenue. But what people don't understand is the time spent speaking is the easy part. It is this time running your business that is the hard part. So if you do have to scale back 
what do you have in place that's going to do that? So if you look at that, you think, wow, that time between 63 and 67, those are four earning years that if you haven't prepared well, you could run out of money. How do you avoid running out of money? Well, take up smoking, do really unhealthy things so you die earlier. Not really the best plan for everybody. So here's what you do if you are a solopreneur, an entrepreneur, whatever. First, let's say you are getting income and you are making five bananas for that day. Five bananas. You do not get to spend five bananas. And many people talk about things in terms of relative to one speech of five bananas. No, you don't get to keep five bananas. For five bananas, five bananas, two bananas go to taxes. You have to allocate that to taxes. One banana goes back into paying your people, running your business, doing your marketing, hiring David Newman, whatever it takes to run your business. And then one banana goes to you maybe as payment. That is part of what funnels your income. And then that fifth banana, that is your retirement. And I say this all the time, it's a very simple solution, but people don't do it. So that retirement, how do you set this up? Easy peasy. There's two easy ways entrepreneurs and speakers can do this. First, have an IRA. It's an individual retirement account. It is solely yours. It is only yours. There are two, count them, two kinds of IRAs. Real basic for normal people. One is an individual traditional IRA where you get the tax breaks later. The premise there is that your tax bracket will be lower when you are in retirement. So when you take that money out and you can start taking it out at 59 and a half, but you must start taking it out of a traditional or regular IRA by the time you're 70 and a half because you know, the government wants you to pay taxes and that's just kind of how it works. And you haven't paid taxes on that money yet, which is why the government wants to make sure you start taking that money out. The second kind of course is a Roth IRA. So a Roth IRA is the singularly best thing Congress has done for saving for retirement because the money you put in, you've already paid taxes on that money as income. And then you sock that money away into a Roth IRA and it grows tax-free forever. That's fantastic. Here's the issue. Once you start making what you and I term affectionately as real money, you can't put money into a Roth IRA anymore because it's too good a deal. So now you are pretty much limited to the traditional IRA. It is still a really good deal, but if you can, if you do have the Roth option, do the Roth. If you can't do that, you can do the traditional. But the other thing I talk to entrepreneurs about is a SEP plan, and that is your self-employed pension. And you can put in up to 25% of your net income into a SEP, and that decreases your tax liability now, and it allows you to manage that retirement. So either have an IRA or have a SEP plan. The only danger with a SEP plan is many people forget to put money into it and they don't plan for it all year long. And again, it's got to be on your net. So some people do their gross and then they get a little friendly letter from the IRS that says, you put in too much money into your SEP, you must withdraw it and here's a penalty. So you have to be a little bit careful about that and you have to really know your numbers. And especially for a lot of speakers, they don't plan out their year in terms of what it is they make. So part of planning for your retirement is knowing what it is you think you're going to make for the year and the five banana rule. I want to posit something crazy right now. The intersection of your economics and my marketing. It's kind of like when you know the Reese's cup came together and the chocolate met the peanut butter. You talk about knowing your numbers, setting aside money, knowing your profitability, et cetera. If we actually knew on a month-to-month -month basis and we were in touch with how much it takes to run our business, what it takes to set aside the taxes, what it takes to pay for Infusionsoft and monthly subscriptions and memberships and buying books on Amazon and air travel and whatever. If you were just in touch with the economics of your business, do you think we would stick more to our fees we would market more aggressively. We would work harder to bring money in the door because they realize, oh my God, you know what? I just turned around and $8,000 is my zero number. I got to make $8,000 to get to zero profit. So I'm not making a cent until I've made 8,000. I'd like to make 8,000 profit. I need to bring in $16,000 this month. Would that stimulate people to take marketing and sales more seriously? 
Yes. And you and I have talked about this a little bit, but I was at a conference and somebody said, would you like to grow your business? I said, it's easy to generate revenue. Revenue is your price times quantity. So that means for a five banana speech times five speeches a year, that's 25 bananas a month. So that's your price times quantity. The price of an individual speech times the quantity of how many speeches you're giving. That is your total revenue. But your total costs are different. Your total costs add up all of your variable costs of your business. And that can be a contractor for a month or a book inventory purchase or whatever it happens to be. Your variable costs, things that change all the time. But then there's your fixed costs. So for example, thanks to my friend, David Newman, instead of storing my books in my basement, I store my books in a storage locker because it's much easier for the big truck to pull in, put the pallets into a storage unit rather than hauling them up and down the stairs of my basement. Way better option. But that costs me about $150 a month. So that's a fixed cost. My accountant is also a fixed cost every month. My office supplies and things, I have a pretty good idea of what that is, my fixed costs. Uh, The people I pay every month, my assistants, my web designers, my video person, all of those things I budget out on a monthly basis. So another speaker called me the other day and said, I'm thinking about changing my business model. I said, okay. And that speaker said, I think I'm spending about $5,000 with all of these other things. And I said, I think you're probably closer to seven. She said, why do you say that? I said, because you're not counting your memberships and your books and the conferences you go to for you and all of these other things. You're just looking at the people you pay every month. It's actually costing you closer to $7,500 to run your business on a month to month basis. And she got really depressed about this. What you and I have both found is that people just don't look at the actual numbers of running their business. We also have to look at where the ROI is. If I'm going to spend $5,000 on some kind of marketing program, am I going to get that back eight times? And so I look at the expenditures in a couple different ways. First off, is this going to generate an ROI that makes sense? And if I'm going to spend this money and I'm not going to get this ROI, what am I doing? Stop it. Just stop it right now. The second thing is take a good hard look at all of the expenditures that you are spending every single month. Look at your subscriptions. Look at the conferences you go to. Where is your value coming from? And if it comes from these events, that's great, but you should be able to map it out. And if you can't map it out, then either you don't want to know the answer or you're really bad at math. And in that case, get help. That's okay. Get help. But the third thing is many people absorb a lot of costs on their personal side that are actually business expenses, like their accountant, like the CPA, like the lawyer, like their insurance. They put it on their personal side instead of running it through a business expense. So I really encourage people to do this. And you know, I've got a free profit and loss statement on my website. There's just a free download. You just go there, get it. I don't track it. I'm not trying to spy on your computer. You just download it and it's your profit and loss statement so that you know every single month, what are you spending? What are you making? And your profit, of course, is that difference between your total revenue and your total variable costs plus your total fixed costs. Add those together and then subtract the difference. Your revenue minus your costs, and that's your profit. Many people don't know when they're making a profit. Yeah, scary. And we're going to get to all the goodies and the links and the downloads because thank you for sharing those. And we're going to just tie those up all in the show notes and we'll, we'll talk about them here as we're wrapping up. So thank you for making those very great offers. What a great episode. Wowza. Tell you what, if you want to ramp up your revenue as an expert who speaks professionally, you should really check out our free online training at doitmarketing.com slash webinar. Let's talk about another economic concept or marketing financial concept that not a lot of speakers are tapped into, which is customer lifetime value. You know, I get hired by the International Glove Association They paid me whatever the number was. I'm back on the hamster wheel trying to find the next gig. And I might never go back to them. I might never ask for a referral. I might never ask for a pre-conference workshop. I might never ask to do a webinar with them again. I'm going to let them sit. Customer lifetime value, I think, too often is one gig value. It shouldn't be that way, right? If they love you and if you love them, There should be many, many opportunities for upselling, cross-selling, helping their members more. The big sales gurus call this strategic account management. 
I think speakers are terrible at strategic account management and they're just thinking, well, let me get the gig and then I'll go home. How would you look at customer lifetime value and expanding it and extending it? Again, that's such a great question. You know, you've got a new book coming out called Do It Speaker. And when you came out with that book, we're all looking for, say, testimonials that will help us sell us our book, whatever. When you start to think about who would write you the best testimonial, those are your customer lifetime value people. Because you know, you can send it to them and say, hey, could you give us a great referral? Our last book, Gary Ridge, the CEO of WD40, gave us a great testimonial. So that happens again, because you are a customer lifetime value relationship person for them. You consistently provide value. When they call me up and they say, hey, we've got a great customer service conference next year. Who do you know? And I say, you know what, let me recommend these five people and here's why. I want to continue to be a resource. Now, here's the deal. That doesn't happen if you're not doing your part. And this is where I think we as speakers fall short all the time, is that we kind of only talk to our customers when we want the gig. And we're really good about that. But it's kind of like a teenager who only talks to mom and dad when they want the car keys. So we have to get over that part. We have to hang out with mom and dad. We have to sit on the couch and watch a movie with them. We have to continue to provide value all the time. And this takes follow-up, give, 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 and then give some more. And this is where you're great, by the way, because you constantly provide value. Many speakers are very much in a scarcity mentality and they think, well, if I give them the farm, then they're not going to want to buy the farm. Well, wait a second. They kind of do. They want to have this relationship with you. And we fail to see that if we continue to give, give, give support, 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 that it benefits us in the long run, but it also benefits them. And that's really what we should be focusing on, number one. And number two, this is very much a relationship-based business. So my big question is always, so what are you doing to keep your side of the relationship good? What are you doing to help? What are you doing to support them? They gave you a check five years ago. What have you done since then? Have you reached out just to say, hey, how you doing? How are things going? Now, when that happens, a lot of times they're like, uh, now they're asking for the car keys again. And we've made them skittish because they think there's going to be a sell. So my big question is, what are you doing to follow up with all of your customers in a way that's not salesy? Because if you're good enough and that relationship is strong enough, the sale will come. Yes, absolutely right. I totally love that. I love the analogy of mom and dad and the car keys, because if that's the only time that we're in touch, that's a transaction. That's not a relationship. The relationship is a random call What's up? What's cooking? What are you working on? How can I help? Here's an article. Here's a video. Here's something cool. I tell my clients that the best role you can play in a prospect or a client's life is a pointer outer of cool things. You be the source. Hey, you know what, Barbara? I'm listening to this awesome, amazing podcast about trends in the accounting industry. This is your accounting association. Don't know if you've, you know, heard it, but it's awesome. It made me think of you. It just came across my desk. Here's the link. Have a listen and feel free to share it with your team. No ask, no car keys, no, hey, you're planning a next meeting. What's going on, big guy? How you doing? None of that. So what's the cadence of that keep in touch relationship building? Do you like to do that every month? Do you like to do it four times a year? How much is enough where they keep loving on you and keep appreciating you and it doesn't start to feel like weird or intrusive? Right. So I do a series of different things. I'm the first one to say I could be better at it too. I think we all could. I take an approach that, again, different communication for different people. We have to communicate in a way that works for them. So I carry around a series of about 10 different kinds of postcards that I made on Vistaprint. So some are pictures of my dog, some are pictures of where I live, some are pictures of you know big convention centers. And so I just carry them around. They're already stamped. They're already ready to go. And about once a year, I have my assistant print out everybody that we've done business with over the past 10 years, a mailing label. So I keep a folder with me of mailing labels, postcards already stamped, And so when I've got 15, 20 minutes at the airport, I go back through that list and I'm like, I haven't talked to Joe Bob in a while. So I slap on that label. Hey, Joe Bob, I was just in Houston. Made me think about when we were in Houston together for that event a couple years ago. Hope everything's going great. Mary. 
That's it. No ask, no everything, just a touch point. I still do postcards, handwritten notes. I still do that. As you know, I also have a newsletter. And again, that's just a touch point. That's just a, hey, here's an article that might be of value to you. I hope it helps. That's it. Is there an ask at the bottom? Sure. There's a, you can book Mary. But again, I don't care if they open that newsletter. I don't care anything about it. All I want is for them to see my name in their email and go, oh yeah, Mary, that's it. So that's kind of a more consistent thing. And again, I write the content. I've got an assistant who makes all that magic happen. The third thing I started doing was free webinars. Gee, where did I learn that from? Free webinars that I send out to all of the people on my list just going, hey, I'm going to do this thing on business strategy. I just did one last week on succession planning. And so about every quarter, it is just a give. And it is, here it is. It does cost money to do this. As you know, there's a landing page and then there's the replay and then there's all the materials that go with it, but it is just a give. And it is a way for my clients to go, oh, couple things. First, they do get value out of it. And like I've been taught by you, you give away the farm, you give it away. And then they go, oh, that's a great idea. But it puts you in contact with people and it reminds them of what it is you do. Now, do you get anything right away? Sometimes the answer is no, but sometimes the answer is yes. Number four, pick up the stupid phone. You don't have to actually talk to people if you don't want to, but pick up the phone and make the call. Sales is about relationships, but people have come to talk about salesy as that big push, that aggressiveness, that that icky feeling. Great sales is beautifully done. Great sales is solidifying the relationship in a way that makes them think of only you. You're back to being the Oreo cookie. Ooh, I like that. Oreo cookie. I think we should end on dessert. Oreo cookie time. I've got two final questions for you. The final, final question is to hook us up with all your fantastic resources and how people can get connected and stay connected to Mary Kelly World. Before we get to that, though, if folks were to take one overarching idea, either about the economy or about running their business in any economy, what is the key concept that you hope they would take from our conversation? That in good times or in bad times, it is relationships that matter. And we can always do a little bit better building those relationships with people we genuinely care about and with people we want to do business with. Nice. You mean we have to care about them? It's nice to hear. I did have a CEO who said, well, can I just pretend to care? (laughs) Very nice. Yeah. Fake authenticity. That's the key to a great relationship. That's right. That's right. No, that's brilliant. Absolutely. Okay. People are connecting with you. Where do they go? What can we give them? And we're going to hook all these up in the show notes on folks. Go to thespeakingshow.com right under this episode with the awesome Mary Kelly. What are we giving them? Where are we pointing them? Thank you. So productiveleaders.com forward slash free dash resources. Or if you just type in productiveleaders.com, type in free, it pops right up. And you know, I use my productivity sheet every single day. This is the thing you do every single day to make sure you're not getting lazy, you're not getting arrogant, you're not getting complacent. This is what you structure your day with in order to stay successful. There's the productivity day and the productivity week. Maps things out, get things done. And part of that is building relationships. Also on there is the profit loss statement like we talked about. You know that I'm a big fan of planning your strategy, doing your strategy. So there's the five-minute business plan, the five-minute vision plan, the five-minute productivity plan to make sure you're not wasting time. Time is all we got, so let's not waste it. And then there's just a whole bunch of other goodies. There's checklists on how you can start planning your own succession for your own business. There's articles and resources and just all kinds of goodies. And if anybody's got questions or they're like, I'm really looking for a plan like whatever, I've got a new book coming out, which is all 50 of my five-minute plans. And that's coming out this year as well. And it's a, a huge book on just how to save, how to improve your productivity, improve your leadership, less stress, less tension, get out of the office sooner. You have 50 of those five-minute tools? I actually have 70. And so in this book, we've taken the top, whatever, I'm calling it 249 minutes to improve your life. So one of them is only going to be four minutes because 249 sounded like a better number than 250. I don't know why. I agree. I agree. And when's that coming out? That should actually be out in September. So that's exciting. Very nice. September 2019, people get the book. 
Can they get it on your website, Amazon, yeah. everywhere? It's going to be everywhere. It's going to be a big eight and a half by 11 thing. I've got a remarkably talented creative person who is making, you know, I'm very linear. So mine is very, you know, like this. She's making it pretty and nice and fun. I'm very excited to have that coming out. I've got some other projects in the works that we'll talk about at other times. People can stay in touch with me at ProductiveLeaders.com. If you've got a challenge that is, oh gosh, you know, I've got this situation. I might have a five minute plan that solves that problem or could help you out. So just send me an email. I'm happy to respond. Brilliant. Mary Kelly, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to have to have you back. I'd love it, David. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Speaking Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on iTunes. Subscribe. Tell a friend. Go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thespeakingshow.com. See you next time. 